Good afternoon. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting this afternoon to go over um, another draft of our uh, pension governance and task force bill. Um, I believe committee members, you'll be able to access version 1.2 up on our committee page. Um, Becky Wasserman, who drafted the bill, is uh, needed in another committee. So we have Damian Leonard with us today, and he's going to help convey uh, any decisions that we make about uh, the language in front of us back to, to Becky. Um, so thank you, Damian, for being here today. Happy to help out. Um, so Rep Gannon has, uh, has been working with Becky to incorporate some of the changes that we uh, believe are, are responsive to some of the testimony that we heard last week. So um, before long, I'll ask him to, uh, to, to begin taking us through and pointing out the changes. Um, I did want to make note for the benefit of the committee that um, over the weekend, uh, I, or actually yesterday, um, we reached out to the chairs of the three retirement system boards who all send representatives to VPIC. Um, I wanted to make sure that the, uh, the recommendations that VPIC had made originally, uh, as well as the revisions that they presented to us late last week were uh, were, were well received by the three system boards um, because it is after all their uh, retirement system funds that VPIC is investing and we wanna make sure that they're comfortable with the changes. So we met with um, two of the system board chairs yesterday. The third was not available, but he did email us um, after we were done meeting and said that he had had a conversation with the chair of VPIC and felt very comfortable with the direction that things were heading. And so um, I wanted to make sure that you all knew that we had done uh, that, that additional step to make sure that we got their perspective on the changes that we are looking at here. So uh, if there are no other questions, I will um, rep Hooper. Hello, Peter here. Uh, so you talked to the chairs, but the boards have not taken a position. Is that correct? That is correct. So chairs not having the ability to speak for the boards. That's the root of my question, I guess. Not and I'm not sure when each of the boards is planning to meet. Um, Rep Gannon may have a better recollection than I because he tends to have a memory like a vice in remembering uh, what what people might have mentioned. But uh, this is this bill isn't going to be coming to the floor tomorrow. So I'm sure that if the boards feel that they need to revise uh, the statement that their chair made, uh, there will still be time for us to hear from them and have a conversation with them if there are helpful suggestions that they make to the way we're moving forward. Yeah. Well, the reason I ask is that <laughs> at lunchtime, instead of walking around, I was on the phone with one of the board members who called me who said that uh, there was a request to endorse VPIC's action and they could not even get a motion brought forward. So that kind of throws things into a soup that I don't know where that is. Thank you. And I expect that folks will uh, be following along on our YouTube stream. And if they have a desire to come and uh, testify before the committee, they can certainly get in touch with our committee assistant, Andrea Hussey, and um, we will do our best to hear from folks uh, anytime between now and when the House moves the bill out of our chamber, which I expect won't be until uh, late this week or early next week. Um, Rep Higley. I'm having trouble finding the document. I'm looking under today's day. Um, it is under Damian Leonard's name because he's ledge counsel who's with us today, even though he didn't draft the bill, but he's, uh, he is. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rep Gannon, anything that you wanted to add to that since my memory is like Swiss cheese? 
Um, so, so two things. Um, one, you know, the chair reviewed with um, each the chair of Vsters and Vemers the, the legislative process, and that there was plenty of opportunity to chime in either on the House side or on the Senate side. Um, she explained that process, I think, fairly well, so that they understood that there's um, multiple opportunities um, to be heard uh, with respect to the bill. Um, I believe Vsers is meeting um, this week. Um, if that's my recollection. I do not know about the other two boards. State board met this morning. Okay. Great. Um, Rep Hickley, did you find the document okay? I did not. I'm under Damien's yeah. name, but... Uh, oh. On um, our committee page under today's date, if maybe you need to hit refresh. Okay. I'm, I'm seeing it. But it just got posted, so you probably do have to hit refresh. Okay, thanks. Of course, where he lives up there, they have to import sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> it it may be that that uh, that little data signal had to ping through Montreal before it came down to your house, Rep. Hegley. My apologies for the long transmission time. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, Rep Yannon to help the committee understand uh, what we're seeing in the draft in front of us that's different from before. Right, thank you, Madam Chair. And just to remind people, we heard testimony um, from both the VSEA, the teachers union, um, VPIC, and we had, I think, a fairly healthy committee discussion. Um, in addition to that, some members reached out to the chair or myself with respect to suggestions um, about how to modify the bill. And we've tried to incorporate um, what we thought was uh, things that were, were good ads and that were consistent with the overall um, structure of the bill as we see it going forward. Um, so I re really appreciate all the members who, who chimed in and helped and, and all the people from outside the legislature who had, had good ideas about how to improve the bill. Um, so as you'll see, um, all the changes are highlighted. Um, and so I'm going to move through some of them quickly. Um, we've named the, the task force, the Pension Benefits Design and Funding Task Force. Um, and then I'm going to move to page two of the bill where we have um, a new and improved definition of what independent means. And so there are two aspects of uh, independence. Um, one is that um, an, indi an individual has a direct or material interest in the plan if that individual or his spouse or her spouse, parent, child, sibling, or in-law is a beneficiary of the plan. Um, and then two, the individual or the individual spouse, parent, child, sibling, um, or in-law has been within the past five years, an employee, director, officer, consultant, owner, consultant, manager, or had an other material role with an entity servicing the plan. So an example of that would be the investment advisor or the actuary. Um, so th those two. And then um, in B there, we just define um, what uh, ownership in a publicly traded company is, which is owning 5% more directly or indirectly um, in any equity security registered under the Securities Ex Exchange Act of 1934. So that's the, the, the new improved definition um, of independent. Basically what it did is I took out the negatives and, and said, you know, when is somebody have an indirect or direct material um, interest? Um, and that was based on some input from VPIC. Um, then further down on page two, um, we're referencing VPIC as an independent committee. This is consistent with the testimony we heard from VPIC um, about their direction of becoming an independent from the treasurer's office. Um, and so you'll see a couple changes um, in this section of the document um, with respect to that independence. Um, then the, the then we go through the list of the 10 members of the of VPIC. Um, one member 
uh, and an alternate is elected by the board of the Vermont State Employees Retirement System. One member and one alternate is elected um, by um, the board of the State Teachers Retirement um, System of Vermont, and one member and one alternate uh, elected by uh, the board of the Vermont Municipal Employees Retirement System. Uh, then um, two members and one alternate who, and this is the important change, who shall be a financial expert and independent appointed by the governor. So those are our independent financial experts that will be on VPIC. Um, next, we have the state treasurer. Um, and then one member appointed, that's you know how the chair is elected. Um, and a change is in seven is instead of the commissioner for um, finance, uh, we have the commissioner for financial regulation. Um, this was a suggestion by Rep. Anthony, um, who thought that um, this would be less political. And, you know, having looked at um, the commissioner's experience um, as an attorney at Skadden Arps and as the securities regulator um, for DFR before he became the commissioner, um, he seems to have the, the correct experience um, to play a good role on VPIC. Next, we have one municipal employer who's appointed by the executive director of VLCT um, and one school employer um, who is appointed by the Vermont School Boards Association. So that's the makeup of VPIC. Um, so then we move down. Oh, and I should say there was one thing deleted. Um, originally, we had the, the municipal and school employer um, appointees to be independent. Um, but in discussions, uh, we learned that would eliminate um, superintendents and town managers from potentially serving on VPIC. So we eliminated that independence requirement for those two positions. Rep Hooper has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, John, the number nine, the school boards association, you might have just answered that uh, while I was waiting, but does the school board association and not the superintendent's association or something like that, are they meshed enough that a superintendent could serve or is it just somebody from school boards or is it anybody in the world? Well, it says it, one school employer. So it'd have to be a school employer, which could be a superintendent okay. or a school board member. I mean, it, it's, it's obviously the, the Vermont School Boards Association will make the determination of who, who's best suited to fill that role. And uh, when I was on the school board, I was never considered an employer. Is that vague? I mean, we could modify that language um, to include um, a school board member because they would not, well, I mean, sometimes they're, well, Damien would be an expert maybe on this. Um, you know, would a select board member or a school board member be considered an employer for, for purposes um, of this? So it, it really depends on the employment law. Uh, some employment laws go to, uh, go all the way back to management members. Others look at the entity. Um, you, you could um, potentially address the concern with something uh, uh, saying uh, one member, um, you know, uh, uh, one member uh, representing the interests of school employers or, um, you know, who, uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, I think representing the interests of school employers or representing school employers um, would kind of get at what, like, the school boards association is doing. Um, which is kind of representing the school employer's interests in terms of their financial interests. So that that might be a better way to get around it. So you don't have a question of, you know, the superintendent who's also an employee of the, the school district. Are they technically the employer? And in some cases, yes. For example, if they allow discrimination to occur at their school, um, despite having knowledge of it, they could be considered the employer but in other cases they might not be. So um, that, that would be, uh, my recommendation is just to use the one member 
and then I'm, I'm not sure what the best way to phrase the second part is, but um, I'd, I would leave that up to you and I can make a note to Becky here if that makes sense for the committee. If I may make a suggestion, you could refer to that person as being uh, involved in uh, superintendency's governance, and then you would avoid the uh, uh, um, conundrum of trying to uh, fit that into either employer or employee pigeonhole. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have Rep Leclerc with a hand up. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I'm a little confused here. The, um, the one school employer, when I was on a school board for 10 or 12 years, I was always considered the employer. And whenever we were in contract negotiations or whenever you even had a signed contract. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the problem here is with the current language. So uh, the... I think the, the question is just a, an, an issue of clarity. So when you were on the school board, you were considered part of the school employer, um, but you were negotiating, if you, for example, were in contract negotiations, you were negotiating on behalf of the school district as a member of its governing body in right. the same way that management negotiates on behalf of uh, the employer. <clears throat> um, in some instances, employer, I mean, and this is one of the difficulties coming from my branch. In some instances, the word employer doesn't mean the manager. In other instances, it includes the manager or the board or the other governing body of that employer. Um, for your, from your standpoint, um, it, it may be clear. I'm just not familiar enough with this, but I, I think you could make it you know, um, just saying one individual, um, you know, who uh, is involved in the governance of a municipal employer um, or uh, one individual representing municipal employers, um, that sort of thing. The problem if you go with one individual representing is it could be the executive director of VLCT appoints the deputy director of VLCT or something like that, which maybe that's not your intent. Maybe your intent is to get a select board member or something like that. Um, or maybe your intent is to leave it open-ended. So that's kind of a question of who do you see serving here? And then that might be a better way to phrase it. Um, you know, For example, if what you want is a school board member, then you would say, one member who is a member of the board of a supervisory unit or union or school district appointed by the Vermont School Boards Association. Um, and then for the municipal right. employer, you might say one member who is uh, a member of the select board or city council of a municipality. Um, but, but going back to your example, Damien, I mean, like for the school, um, school employer, I mean, it, you could have a superintendent you could mm -hmm. have a, a, a business manager. Um, I mean, I, I could see a few different scenarios there. So, okay. yeah. So if um, your goal though, is to have the superintendent, the um, superintendent, a business manager or a school board member, or maybe just a superintendent or a business manager, it might make sense to spell that out um, because right now it's, the, the concern I would have is so, you know, your school employer could be the Burlington School District, um, or it could be the members of the school board of the Burlington School District, or perhaps you want the business manager because they have a better understanding of the financial affairs of the school district than the school board members do. And in that case, you might want to say, you know, a member who is, uh, you know, fits these criteria. Um, because otherwise you, you could end up with someone, uh, you know, who maybe is, is not what you're intending to have on this, uh, committee. Um, and so that, I think that's, you know, my, my advice here is that right now employer is vague, um, or my, my observation. So if your intent is to leave it very open-ended, then it's probably, um, okay. 
Um, but if your intent is to specifically direct it at certain individuals um, who have specific expertise or experience, uh, then you may want to spell that out. So, so Damien, just following up on that. So in both these, the, the municipal employer is going to be a town or city, correct? I mean, yeah, so a municipal employer is a, is a town or city. Um, I, and for school, it's going to be the school district. Yes, or the supervisory union. So, or the, right. So if we said a representative of a municipal employer or a management representative of a municipal employer, would that help fix it? Yep, or you could say... Um, yeah, it, you could say a representative of a municipal employer or a representative of a municipal employer, employer with knowledge of, um, you know, municipal financial concerns. I'm not sure the best way to put that. Again, we're getting outside of my area of expertise, <laughs> but, um, you know, with knowledge of, for example, municipal budget issues or municipal um, finance uh, or something like that. But you, if you say a representative of a municipal employer, it's, it's pretty clear. You want an individual who can represent uh, a municipal employer. Um, if you say you want a representative of municipal employers, that might be steering you more towards someone who's got statewide experience. Um, but it could also be someone who's very knowledgeable from a particular municipality uh, who can speak on behalf of a broad range of employers. <laughs> Okay. So, so sorry to complicate this. Not, not at all. Um, that was responsive to the question. Um, so, committee, I think it's worthwhile just uh, refocusing our our view on uh, this is the makeup of the investment committee, who will be making the investment decisions uh, in the hopes of growing our public uh, employee pension funds, and so. Uh, from that standpoint, um, you know, we should ask ourselves whether we think it, we need to be more pres prescriptive or less prescriptive in terms of giving uh, those entities uh, the ability to appoint somebody who can effectively uh, help make those decisions. Representative Hooper. Well, just, I mean, the reason I ask, and I did not intend to complicate it this much is when I served on the Burlington School Board, we basically, except for certain purely academic things, considered ourselves to be agents of the city. Teachers were members of the city re retirement system, blah, 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 blah. So a municipal employer and a school employer seem to be synonymous in that context. I have no idea what anybody else does. That was the root of the question, and I don't mind moving on. Back to you, Rep. Gannon. Thanks. Um, the next change um, is on page five. Um, this was a, a recommendation um, from Jeff Fannin um, that we put removal language um, into um, this section of the bill with respect to VPIC. And so here, members of the board may, re may, re ugh, may be removed only for cause, and the board shall adopt rules pursuant to 3VSA Chapter 25 to define the basis and process for removal. And I believe 3VSA chapter 25 is the Administrative Procedures Act. And, or at least that's, that was what my intent was when I suggested this, this change based on Jeff Fannin's um, suggestion. Um, Rep. Then, Hilsky has a question. Oops, sorry. No worries, thank you. I just got my hand up. Um, so I noticed right underneath that, that the chair of the VPIC still has the 20 year term instead of a 12 year term like the rest of the members. And I recall we heard significant testimony that they should be the same 12 year term. It, why is that still 20 years? What's our rationale there? So um, that is certainly open to a, a discussion for the committee to decide. Um, and I, I think the rationale for setting it originally at 20 was simply to say that if somebody had already served um, as a member of VPIC and then was selected to become chair, um, we, we wouldn't want them to be termed out from being able to do that. 
Um, so let's have a little committee discussion at this point about that section two, so we can decide whether we want to change the uh, the term limit for the chair. Sam Lefebvre, Rep Lefebvre, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Tanya asked my question and I um, was just hoping for more clarification on, and I apologize if I, if I have missed it, but can people serve, like as you have just explained, and then take a break and come back? Or is it just those are the absolute amount of years that you are allowed to be on there? I believe the way it's drafted, um, the language is a hard and fast um, three terms, but uh, that is certainly open for committee discussion. Rep Gannon, do you wanna weigh in on that? No, no, you're absolutely correct, Madam Chair. Um, it, it's hard and fast rule, three terms. Um, that, that could be modified. We could say people could take a term break. Um, I've seen that language um, um, in other bills and in other, um, you know, board governance structures. So it's something we could consider. Rep Hooper. I generally think that we have to keep in the back of our minds that it's going to be hard to get people who are willing to make this commitment. So I know that people have talked about the ability to eliminate people from getting stale. Um, we don't put that encumbrance upon ourselves in the legislature. Um, and it, it, the unintended consequence of this is you may have very good people getting off. I generally think a term limit is called an election and that should suffice. Other committee discussion? Rep. Pihotsky? Um, just in response to that, given that all of these seats are appointed and not elected, that feels a little bit like it's not quite the same, like we're comparing apples and llamas. Um, so I just, I, I, I'm not opposed to the sort of term break language. I'm just, yeah, I, I just think this is worth some more thought. It doesn't sound like people have huge thoughts right now, but I do know we heard multiple people testify that this was kind of problematic. So I guess my space in that is if we don't have strong opinions, perhaps we go with what we heard from testimony because some people did have strong opinions. Rep Leclerc. Um, I, I, I would have no concern bumping that from 20 years down to 12 to, to match the others, especially if you have staggered uh, terms. And if, if the member from Burlington was advocating for term limits, I would probably have to agree with him Other committee observations, committee discussion about the issues around continuous term limits versus taking a term off or the term of the chair. The only other thing I would say, Madam Chair, is that um, this language came from BPIC, was part of the proposal. And, and just knowing that, that Tom Galanka has already served for, I think, four or five years, that may have had something to do with the extended term. I mean, I think most people on the committee would agree that he's done a superb job in managing VPIC over those years. And um, I, for one, would hate to, to see him go. But I, I just throw that out there for context. I agree with you, Mr. Vice Chair and um, and, uh, Rep. Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a point of information. Well, I would agree with John, and that sort of speaks to me about term limits might not necessarily be appropriate at all. But are we starting the clock over here with this new commission, or is are you guilty by past history for time already accrued? It's my understanding that time already accrued will be kind of toward your term limit. When we addressed this with the uh, Liquor Control Board, when it became, uh, well, I think actually when we modernized those statutes before it became the Board of Liquor and Lottery, we were, we were clear 
about whether or not we were going to include prior time. And in that case, we were very clear that we weren't including prior time because um, the assumption was otherwise that those term limits would apply. Uh, and there, there was some institutional knowledge that they wanted to keep on the board um, because otherwise they were going to lose a significant portion of that board at the time uh, because of the new term limits. Um, so I would say if, if you're looking to uh, make prior time not apply, you should be very clear about that. But otherwise, I think the assumption is that the term limits apply uh, going forward as far as not more than three terms and so forth. So if you've already served multiple terms, um, you should make, be clear if you're not going to count prior terms. McCarthy. Yeah, I guess I don't have discomfort with the longer term for the chair because in this language, the chair serves at the pleasure of the rest of the committee and is elected by them and is different in that way than the rest of the members of the new VPIC. So I, I don't really, you know, I, I think that in that way, since the rest of the committee has a lot of power that they wouldn't have over each other, but they do on the chair. Um, that's a big difference to me in this particular instance. Rep Anthony. You are muted. I thank Damien for <clears throat> uh, illustrating that there is a parallel example for being very explicit. And I would suggest that we do be very explicit and because the newly constituted group uh, will be significantly reconfigured. I really think we ought to start at ground zero. I'm comfortable with the 20 year chair or going to say 16, but I really think the chair as uh, Rep Hooper has said, because it's elected, uh, it is different uh, than the folks serving. And if they select a chair, which has proved, that person has proved out to be very successful and helpful, I don't see why that person should be removed. So I, I would start at ground zero. The term limits start when this new body is constituted and the chair gets to serve longer, whether it's 20 or 16, uh, that's okay, thanks. Rep Hooper, your hand is still up, is that from before? It is, Madam Chair, I apologize. No worries, thank you. All right, back to you, Rep Gannon. We will flag this as a decision point that we need to make as we move towards final passage. Okay. Um, also highlighted on page five at the very bottom, um, which is not a new change, um, but it is highlighted and it's a decision point for the committee is that no legislature who is currently serving in the General Assembly shall serve on the committee. VPIC did not take a position on that as their memo pointed out, um, but obviously this is um, a decision point we need to, to address. Um, all right. Um, then I'm gonna move down. Um, the next change on page six is, oops. Representative McClare. Sorry, um, there, there currently isn't an active legislator serving in that role now, correct? There is a legislator serving on VPIC. There is. Representative Hooper serves on VPIC. Oh, sorry. I'm disregard that question. <laughs> okay. Um, moving down to page six. Um, we've slightly modified the um, quorum requirement. So a uh, quorum would be five members of a 10 member board. Um, so Again, modified is there needs to be five concurring votes shall be necessary for a decision of the committee at a, any meeting of the committee. So that's up from four. Um, then going down to the bottom of page six and the top of page seven, the chair of the committee may be compensated from the funds at a level not to exceed one third of the salary of the, the state treasurer as determined by the other members of the committee. That is not a change, but I think 
and I may be incorrect in who, who said this, but I think it was rep Representative Hooper who suggested that the compensation should be higher. And the treasurer. Should be higher than the treasurer? <laughs> no, the treasurer also suggested that. Um, yeah, and the treasurer did. Thank you. Sorry. It works um, far harder than uh, the equivalent of one third of her salary. Anyone have a opinion they want to express on that question? Rep Hooper. You know, it's it's a weird thing because just, you know, I think we're making this decision based on an individual uh, because Tom puts in, I think, an inordinate amount of time and does an excellent job. Um, and quite frankly, off the top of my head, I don't know what a third of the treasurer's salary is, uh, but I would expect it's probably in the $50,000 range uh, to get somebody to do this outside state government. Pretty sure you would consider that a somewhere between highway robbery and a bargain. So um, I would have absolutely no problem with recommending it go up. Rep Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do we know what the present value of the uh, treasurer's salary is today? I think it's pretty uh, easy to find that out. I don't have the number off the top of my head. Perhaps somebody else in the room uh, knows where to look that up. So hang tight. We'll see if we can come up with that number. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I think it would be in the Pay Act. Um, yeah, it is. Okay, I'll go look, thank you. That's where I saw the list, Rep Fihovsky. Um, Just a point of clarification, is the job of being chair of the VPIC a full-time job? Okay. It isn't supposed to be. <laughs> that fair point. <laughs> the past couple of weeks, it may have felt like it. <laughs> Uh, any other opinions or thoughts with respect to the highlighted section at the bottom of page six and top of page seven? Rep. Pihovsky. Thank you. I just pr processing on the fly here. It feels to me, and I certainly can't can't speak to what's standard within this world because it's not a, a world that I work in, but it feels to me that $50,000 is a pretty decent sum for a supplemental position. Um, that isn't full time. So I certainly am um, has it. I just, it just, yeah. Like I said, I, I can't speak to this work, but that does seem like that. I mean, that's more than I make in a year in my full time job. So that certainly feels like a sizable amount. Damian Leonard, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to note that um, under 32 VSA 1003A, the treasurer's salary is uh, 116745 as of January 5th of last year. So 116, not 160. 116745. Yep. And that's as of uh, January 5th, 2020. Um, I don't know if the Pay Act put in an interim pay rate above that. It did. Okay. So I'm not sure what that would be, but uh, that's the one that I have it's probably available quickly. And a third is 40. Any other committee discussion on the question of the recommendation by a few folks in this conversation to uh, increase the salary of the chair? Okay. Nobody has a strong opinion. Well, almost, almost none of us have a strong opinion at this moment. I mean, the only thing I'd say is that, uh, you know, if you look south to, of our border to Massachusetts, the chair of Prim makes north of $800,000 a year. Um, now, that may be a full-time position, but I, I mean, s some of these positions are highly compensated because um, they involve the need for a lot of financial and investment expertise. Now, Prim has taken in a lot of its 
investment management inside its house instead of you know hiring outside investment managers. So it is a slightly different model. Um, however, you know if we are truly inter interested in this, I mean maybe the solution is a compensation study so that we're not just shooting in the dark as to what the salary should be. I believe that's a great suggestion. Is it okay to move on, Matt? Oops. Uh, we got a couple of hands. Uh, <laughs> Rep Hooper. Are you suggesting, John, that get added into this charge to the committee? Um, I, I think lower down, there is a charge for a report with respect to independence. Um, we could look at seeing if we could add it there That's as a good part one. of that. Rep Pihovsky. Thank you. I, again, am just sort of processing out loud, but I wonder if rather than linking the salary to the treasurer's salary, if linking it to the performance of the fund makes more sense. Well, again, using the model of PRIM, I believe um, there are financial incentives tied to performance. And I guess um, in the context of this conversation, I feel a little bit more comfortable with suggesting that, uh, that the VPIC in their study of moving towards independence um, also consider uh, the compensation of their chair in that um, in that conversation and come back to us with a recommendation. Rep Hooper. How are people feeling about uh, adding that language further down where we uh, ask VPIC to uh, to do a study. Definitely. Okay. That looks like near consensus. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on. Um, still on page seven. Um, and this starts to get into the independence of VPIC from the treasurer. I mean, there's language here that the committee shall have the administrative and technical support of the office of the state treasurer. Um, and then this is new language. The committee may collect proportionally from the funds of the three retirement systems and any individual municipalities that have been allowed to invest their retirement funds pursuant to subsection 523A of this title, any expenses incurred that are associated with carrying out the duties and expenses incurred by the treasurer's office in support of the committee. Um, so this is a slight tweak to the language that was in the bill before, which is focusing the committee um, getting compensated versus the treasurer's office. Um, the language right under that is not new language. The attorney general shall serve as a legal advisor of the committee. That is already the case. <clears throat> I think it was just called out because it's now in a separate subsection. Um, now moving um, to page eight, um, you will note that the report, um, where is it? Okay, so uh, you will recall that VPIC in, in making recommendations for some tweaks um, to our recommendation asked for more time um, to complete certain tasks. Um, and this is one of the places where those changes were made. I, I believe we had it in 90 days and now um, following the recommendation from VPIC, they have 180 days to conduct an asset allocation study. And that study will be submitted to the General Assembly and um, also posted on the Treasurer's website. And that's on page nine of the bill. Um, now we move down to page 10, changes to the actuarial rate of return. 
Um, as was already in the bill, this is determined only by the VPIC and not the retirement boards. Um, so that's just, I'm not sure why that's highlighted. Um, but it's, it's, he has a question. Oh, yep. Yeah, I am actually curious as to this piece because I know we we heard testimony from one of the unions that this should be retained as a decision made in conjunction with the retirement boards. And I mean, in my view, when we're making big changes like this that impact the unfunded liability, we certainly want to have in-depth conversation and come to an agreement and not just unilaterally be able to decide that we can make these changes. So I'm curious why this didn't change back to being a conjunction decision. I, I can speak my view of that and then Rep Gannon, if you have other thoughts. Um, the rate of return is determined by decisions that are made at the investment committee level. And um, we are looking for um, making changes overall to the governance of VPIC that will, uh, that will cause um, a little more clarity and a little more um, transparency for folks to understand uh, whether we're meeting our expected rate of return. And uh, so giving the body whose job it is to obtain a certain rate of return, uh, the ability to set that rate of return makes perfect sense to me. Um, I think this change is, is consistent with the more independent nature of VPIC. Um, and it also focuses the decision of setting the assumed rate of return um, based on VPIC's analysis of um, the securities markets. Um, and rather than looking to see whether we should set the assumed rate of return um, to lower our ADAC payment um, or some other reason um, that does that. If you look historically, um, not only in Vermont, but many states, they have set high assumed rate of returns, which lowers our unfunded liability, um, but ultimately leads to us not meeting assumed rates of return. Um, so, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Representative Higley's, you know, cited the Reason Foundation site website a number of times. They actually do have a terrific, terrific tool there um, that allows you to see what the assumed rate of return is at various states and whether it was met or not. And you can see that most states have set, unfortunately, overly optimistic assumed rates of return. Um, and so one of the things is to try to take out of the, the picture here, um, focus on um, how a assumed rate of return may impact the ADAC payment or the unfunded liability, but to make it truly recognize what market conditions are and what market conditions are expected to be in the future. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, John. I, <clears throat> I don't know where it's appropriate for me to pipe up and take ownership of the uh, suggestion, given the fact that the assumed rate of return just had a, a cold shower, so to say, and has gone down to 7%. I suggested, and I continue to suggest, where it should be inserted in the document is another matter, but I think it ought to stay where it has justifiably been moved to for some period of time so that people focus on other aspirations in their work on the whole issue of pensions. Thanks. Any other committee discussion? All right, back to you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay, um, then moving down to page 11, um, it, it talks about um, beginning on January 15, 2022, um, the committee will provide the House and Senate GovOps committees with a report on the performance of each plan um, versus its demographic investment and other actual assumptions for three, five, ten, three, five, seven, and 10 year periods. And the funding ratio of each plan to each plan beneficiary at the end of each fiscal year. A report of the status of the funding and investment performance of each plan and any relevant information from the asset liability and scenario testing completed during the fiscal year. So that's that's not really changed. The committee shall send written a written copy of the report described in subdivision one of this subsection to the participants and beneficiaries. That is new language. So not only would the, the legislature get it, but the participants would too. 
And I believe that was suggested by a member of the committee. Representative Hooper. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Now, John, define plan for me. Are you covering my aspect or are we just saying there are two plans? Two plans. That's continues to be unacceptable for me. We do deal with um, in the task force cross subsidization. True. Um, I have always maintained that trying to figure out where the unfunded liability is actually coming from, and that might not be viewed as the same thing. I guess I would um, throw in there that um, transparency about any cross subsidization is, is also important to me, but I'm not sure if it makes sense for it to be a part of the snapshot that people see every single year. I think it's perhaps more important to understand trends over time, but you could imagine a scenario where, um, for instance, a large number of judges perhaps retired and all of a sudden uh, the the benefits drawn out of that part of the system are higher for a year than say um, the state troopers um, part of the, the plan. And so uh, I'm certainly open to having that conversation in the future, but since we don't even have uh, a sense at the moment of what that <clears throat> potential cross subsidization looks like, I wouldn't support putting it in uh, the annual report that goes out to beneficiaries just yet. And Cooper? that's not the section actually that I was talking about. I'm talking more about section A, where the performance of each plan, the demographics, all the assumptions, very few of these things are done on an annual basis. Uh, frankly, any of the stuff that gets sent to members would probably be uh, left unread anyway. But again, uh, the fund, each one of the state employees' plans are aggregated and you devise a funded ratio from the three. Um, it just seems, again, unfair, unequitable to say to somebody that they'll be supporting somebody else's plan, one, and two, it seems like we're missing a vital piece of information if we don't require somebody, and this is going to be the eighth time I've asked, to... Uh, designate where the holes are. Well, I, I think that's something that task force is going to look at. So there's still a question of whether there is in fact cross subsidization. Um, we don't have any information one way or the other with respect to that currently. The task force is gonna tackle that and could make a recommendation that we change this part um, of the statute if they feel that that's important. Are we coming to the part where we've mandated that happen? That's in the task force section. We're okay. still in the VPIC section. Thank you. Representative Anthony. Yeah, I, uh, having been a maven on the issue, um, I think it's, it is best left for the tax, task force simply because snapshots and annual reports uh, may, you know, one year go one way and another year go another way. And I think it's incumbent on the tax force, task force to, if they believe uh, that something ought to be tracked and uh, changes to be made, they're the body to make it, not VPIC anyway. Thanks. All right, any other questions? Back to you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay, um, then the next sec change is at the bottom of page 11 and um, the top of page 12. And this is the transition language with respect to members' terms. Um, the original language that we had in here would have a lot of um, terms expiring in 2021 and 2025. And the, the attempt here is to rebalance that so that we don't have so many people um, having their terms expire in one of those two years. Um, so this would more balance um, the um, the terms and let me I'm going to find an email from Becky that explains in practice how this works. Um, so what this provision would do um, is 
Um, there would be three members, members expiring in 2025, two expiring in 2026, and two expiring in 2027. So that sort of more equally distributes when terms are expiring. And so that was the goal, just so we didn't have so many people um, expiring in two years. Representative Anthony. And going back to the previous discussion that Damien flagged for us, namely, do we start at ground zero or do we use accumulated time? I'm assuming that would not throw off what you just read. Am I right, Mr. Vice Chair? Um, I, I believe you're right. Um, Thanks. I think so. Yeah. I, I think the only thing about time served is, is when um, you have completed your um, 12 years of service. And uh, okay. I'm actually getting, uh, or I hope to get that data from Eric Henry um, as to the current members of EPIC and how long they have served. That was my intuition. I just, I think that's right. And I still vote for disregarding the past. All right. Other questions from committee members? All right. All right. Um, I know there's something highlighted on 14, but I think that was from a previous draft. Um, same thing on page 16 um, and 17. All right. So now we get into the pension um, benefit design and funding task force, which begins at the very bottom of page 17 and continues through the rest of the bill. Um, so the first significant change uh, is on page 18, which is that there will be three members who shall be appointed by the president of the Vermont NEA. That's up from two. Um, then moving now, the VSEA still gets to appoint two members. However, there's an addition in that one member of the Vermont Troopers Association who shall be appointed by the president of the Vermont Troopers Association is added. So that is a new position. And I should note that there is no longer a business person on the task force, nor a school board member. Those were eliminated. Rep. Pihovsky. Thank you. So I'm looking at this and one of the calls that we have heard from over and over and over again is about the importance of balance. And I'm still seeing that this is a nine to six labor and non-labor representation, which still strikes me as not balanced. Um, so I would in really hope that we can have additional conversation about, tr about potentially eliminating some of the non-labor representatives or adding additional labor representatives so that we can truly strike a balance? Um, I would argue that this is very balanced. I mean, we have union representatives, we have representatives of the employers, and then we have the legislatures. I think grouping um, the legislature um, with employers or the administration is absolutely incorrect. Um, I know that there, we are all receiving a lot of emails with respect to that. Um, but I don't think that is a fair division. Brett McCarthy. I would say that I share Representative Gannon's point of view on this wholeheartedly. Um, and that I think that when I read some of the messages that I'm receiving, there's a lack of acknowledgement that there are even legislators on this task force. There's a, a lack of understanding from many of the folks who are emailing me what appear to be, you know, form letters about this very issue. Um, the the fact that there are employer representatives, employee representatives, and the representatives of the public, the legislators on our task force proposal. I think the inclusion of the VTA representative is in response to testimony that we heard. And, and I think that that's a really positive addition in this draft. Um, and, you know, I think we heard the concern about the, the, the business person and the appropriateness of having that member of the public there. Um, and, and so I think, you know, we've taken a step in the direction um, that some of the folks who testified wanted us to go. 
with this updated draft, but I, I just, I think that the, the question of what is balanced, this is a very balanced uh, proposal now. And I think that some of the folks who are calling for balance are lumping the legislature in with management. And I, I don't think that's a fair characterization of how the legislature who ultimately will have to take up the recommendations of this task force is gonna behave uh, moving forward. So I, I appreciate the updates in this draft and I think they get us to a place of really good balance. Uh, Rep. Hooper. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, you know, if we look at it in terms of management and worker, it, it's very difficult. But at this point, you know, you're somewhat talking about beneficiaries and managers, and a beneficiary and manager uh, thing is a little out of whack. I mean, that's what I would kind of point out, and would also agree with Rep. Vihosky that. This is not what I would like to see. Closer, not there. Rep Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess uh, I would like to have to agree with uh, Mike McCarthy and uh, um, John in regards to uh, the makeup currently. Um, again, I think the three members being appointed by the speaker and the three members being appointed by the committee on committees, at least at this point in the political uh, realm of things in the state and for what I can see the, the pretty near future as well. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, that would that would definitely be slanted towards um, uh, towards the unions. Thank you. Uh, Representative LeClaire. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I um, we find this hard to believe, but I look at this quite differently in that I don't think that there should be anything around a collective bargaining agreement about this. Um, this is exclusively to talk about the oversight of these pensions. And I would look at this more from skill sets and what the people bring rather than it's a, looked at as a collective bargaining agreement. Other committee discussion on this point? Uh, Rep. Merwicki. Figuring it out. <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm adverse to figuring all this out because I don't want to keep doing the Zoom stuff. So I, I I just wanted to weigh in here and, and <clears throat> I don't want to miss the opportunity to agree with Rep Higley. <laughs> um, but I, I get it when, when people might say legislators, I, I heard it said in part of the testimony that legislators are management. And, and you know, as, as somebody who's, who's been a union member, who's, who's fought for labor issues for a long time, it's, it's hard to hear, but I, I get it when they might perceive us anybody as on the other side of an issue, but uh, I look at the, the makeup of this, this, this committee as, as, um, as equitable and, and, and balanced. And, and I think the, the suggestion that any legislator is necessarily leaning towards management is, is not really accurate. Uh, Rep. Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I, uh, I, I want to thank the chair and vice chair for uh, going quite a ways, <clears throat> more than quite a ways, to try and get the committee uh, to, to sort of hang together and support this, and I will. Uh, and again, like uh, my friend Representative Mariki uh, said, I, I consider myself a, a labor person. I've been a member of three unions over my lifetime. Uh, a retiree of two of them. <clears throat> and uh, I, I just, uh, I find the discussion off base, just talking about, are you management or are you labor? I'm not sure about skill sets, because as I once said, in the context of um, how we were expanding VPEC, um, 
I'm afraid that politics is not and should not be a dirty word. I have to explain to my constituents why I supported a particular proposition. And they include many union members and many management members and all taxpayers. And that's who I have to answer to. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure even skill set is the right way to do it. It feels like it will work. And I, Lord knows, don't want a future uh, uh, chamber to have to go through this pressure cooker that uh, myself and my colleagues did. If this task force works, and I hope it does, nobody will go through this in another 10 years. Uh, and I think we've made great strides to, to create balance, although it's not balance in the, in the, uh, in the nomenclature that certain interests uh, would like to frame it. So thanks. Rep Pihoski. Thank you. I want to be clear. I didn't use the language management. I used the language of labor and non-labor. I wasn't referring to anyone as managers or non-managers. I am simply thinking of who is coming to the table and what is their goal. And right now the goal of and, and who benefits. And so really thinking about the lack of voice of those who are directly benefiting or being impacted from the pension plan. There is not balance there. The people who are going to be impacted by the changes that we make are not equitably represented in this conversation, as opposed to the people who will not as directly be impacted. But, and so it has nothing to do with management, but everything to do with impact. So I just wanted to be clear that I, I never used the terminology management and didn't intend it to seem that way. I appreciate you uh, clarifying that and, um, and also clarifying the interests in this conversation of people who are impacted. Um, <clears throat> Mike McCarthy. Yeah, to, to that point, Madam Chair, when I think about having equitable representation of the people who are impacted on this task force, I wanna make sure that of course, employee groups, beneficiary groups have strong representation. And this proposal really does that. I also wanna make sure that my constituents who aren't plan beneficiaries, but are shouldering the lion's share of the annual cost to maintain the health of the funds at this point uh, are also represented. And, and so I wanna make sure that the employees and beneficiaries have a strong voice, but the taxpayers need to have a voice through the legislators on the committee as well. And I think that when we look at that lens of what's equitable and what voice is there, it's not just about having a number of labor plan beneficiary folks and management folks, because otherwise legislators could just go home. You know, we're there to represent the public and the legislators who are on the committee, I hope, will bring all of that conversation and all of the voice of everyone who's part of the task force and the power of all of that to our body and the other body uh, when they come back to us. And, you know, I see that this is a, a, a very equitable proposed task force through that lens. And I think that there, there, you know, I know that there's this campaign right now because I'm getting the, the form emails that we discussed earlier, but the, the lens that they're looking through is just labor, non-labor or management employee. And I just think that if we're really truly trying to be equitable, we need to look at who's paying for these plans, who is impacted by them. And as we heard in testimony from the employee representatives themselves, these plans aren't just plans that benefit the beneficiaries, they benefit all Vermonters. I am really concerned about saving these plans as a legislator and making sure that the retirement system survives. So uh, that's the equity lens I look through. Thanks. Any other committee discussion on that? All right, back to you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you. Um, moving to page 19, um, there's a new change which says, upon designation and approval, any member appointed pursuant to subdivisions 1D and E of this subsection shall only be, shall be the only representative of the designator to participate in the task force proceedings. So let me put that into plain English. 
Um, a, a couple of the appoint, appointees to the task force are, are hold certain positions like um, the, the um, commissioner of human resources. Um, and in those positions it says, or designee. What this is just saying is that if a designee is, is named, it can only be one designee and that person has to serve um, for the entirety of the task force. So you can't just have multiple um, people showing up at different meetings. Um, this was a suggestion by Representative Anthony. Any questions on that? All right. Thank you, um, back to you. So now we get into the powers and duties section of the task force and there's been a number of changes to this. Um, the, the, I'm gonna skip over the first highlight because that, about benefit provisions to appropriate funding sources. So the, the, the recommendations um, that the task force has to make, and the first one is setting a pension stabilization target number um, for the state employees retirement system and state teacher retirement system that, and I'm not gonna go into this language because we discussed it on Friday, um, uh, you know, it goes through, um, B is a five-year review of benefit expenditure levels, as well as employer and employee contribution levels and growth rates and three and five, 10-year um, levels of rates. That's not new. Um, based on benefit and funding benchmarks, proposed new benefit structures with the objective of adequate benefits within the established cost containment benchmarks, including an evaluation of a shared risk model for employee contributions and cost of living um, adjustments, uh, an estimate of the cost of current and proposed benefit structures on, on a budgetary pay-as-you-go and full actuarial accrual basis, evaluating the intermediate and long-term economic impacts to the state and local economics of proposed changes to benefits for contributions and their potential impact on retiree spending. Um, that is new language that was recommended by Jeff Fannin. Um, e, evaluating any cross subsidization between all groups within the Vermont State Employees Retirement System and adjusting contributions amount to eliminate any cross subsidization. G, evaluating alternative plan designs such as hybrid or defined contribution plan options or a combination of a defined benefit plan and a defined contribution plan. That was a suggestion from Rep Rep Representative Higley and Representative Lefebvre. Um, examining permanent and temporary revenue streams to fund the, the Vermont state, um, state employees retirement system and the state teachers retirement system. Uh, there's a question there about keeping this language um, and um, let me just finish and then I see there's a hand up. Uh, a plan for pre-funding um, other post-employment benefits with an evaluation of using federal funds to the extent permissible. Um, that's existing, that was existing language. A plan to lower other post-employment benefit healthcare costs, including reviewing healthcare, health benefit design innovations, state regulatory measures, and alternative methods of providing pooled healthcare benefits. That was another suggestion by um, Jeff Fannin. Um, then um, down below the task force, well, let me stop there and I, I see Rep Hooper has his hand up. Go ahead, Rep Hooper. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, there's a vast difference between the state employee healthcare plan and the teacher healthcare plan. I just say that in passing. My question though, John, did you up in D uh, give consideration to not only impact of retiree spending, but I mean, a significant part of this is how many people decide they're gonna stay in Vermont to maintain their standard of living. Uh, a lot of the chatter on the Facebook pages is, uh, I'm going south, uh, when people take their entire retirement check and go someplace else with it, um, that's significant. I suspect we should maybe consider adding that in as much as it is determinable, and I don't know if it is. <clears throat> Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> As it's come up a couple of times, and uh, Rep. Gannon, Vice Chair, had uh, sort of uh, 
ticked off the possibility of revenue sources. One of the things that I think Rep Hooper has brought out, and I'm not sure, I almost favor putting it in there because it's not well known. And that is to say any uh, savings in the um, healthcare plans uh, for either group uh, that has arisen recently, and we could define that, or, or in future from a premium holidays. And that essentially would also be a revenue source towards uh, any recommendation for um, OPEB. <clears throat> Rep Pihotsky. Thank you so much and thanks for all the work on this. One of the things that I think it may be sort of encapsulated in the piece around um, impacts to state and local economies, I think is the economic impacts. Um, I And it's sort of included in there, but I think it, these pieces deserve to be more spelled out here. Um, I think that we need any changes being made need to be assessed for their impact on the ability to retain and recruit state employees and teachers. I think we also need to look at that sort of, we need to ensure that we're creating a sub sustainable system and not simply cross subsidizing by forcing, you know, making sure that any changes wouldn't push people onto other state benefits. And then again, I come back to the school budget piece of, you know, does this have a local impact that causes our taxpayers' property taxes to skyrocket? Sure, it's not inclu included in the general fund, but it is still a tax that is being just sort of shifted to a different bucket. So I want to really be careful that those are laid out pretty clearly as important pieces to look at as we're evaluating possible plan options. Committee discussion? Can you just say agree? I would welcome folks at this point, and maybe I should have said this at the beginning, um, but if you have ideas such as that um, to jot your ideas down and work with legislative council to put them into bill language form so that we can uh, consider adding them to the bill. Rep Higley. Madam Chair, this goes to Representative Holsky's uh, concern a little bit maybe under CI, propose new benefit structures with the objective of adequate benefits. I mean, adequate benefits, I would hope would mean adequate to attract and retain employees, you know? So maybe it could be elaborated there, but uh, I, I would I would say that's, that's what that means to me. Okay, I appreciate that suggestion of where, where a few keywords might help to make a finer point um, as opposed to adding a new section. Um, so would welcome folks to keep working on that. Uh, any other committee discussion on the duties of the task force? Back to you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay, thank you. So um, subsection two on uh, page 21, the task force shall not make recommendations on adjusting the assumed rate of return. Um, this was a suggestion by Representative Anthony. Um, this is, you know, under VPIX control, um, it would sort of be financial gamesmanship in some ways for, for the task force to come back and make a rep recommendation with respect to changing the assumed rate of return. Um, so um, that is off the table for the task force with this language. Um, then we, we leave powers and duties and get into stakeholder input. And so there's additions here, solicit input, including through public hearings from affected state stakeholders and an identification of a specific group, um, which is consult with group D members of the state employees retirement systems um, and members of the, the state employees retirement system employed as state correctional officers. Um, so this is to get specific information with respect to them. 
um, with respect to group D, which is judges um, and correction officers, which are typically part of group F. Representative Hooper. Is this the group G coming in here? It's to consult with them. Other questions, comments? All right, we'll um, just reminding folks to, uh, to sit with that stakeholder input um, aspiration and feel free to reach out if you have thoughts on whether that captures who you think the task force needs to be uh, calling in. All right, back to you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, great, um, page 22. A simple but important change at the bottom of that page is the start date of the task force is moved up from July 15th, 2021 to June 15th, 2021. So that adds a month to the task force. Rep Hovsky. Maybe we're getting to this and I'm just a little ahead of myself, which would not be the first time that has happened. Um, are we considering adding time on the other end, given that this task force is making recommendations that we won't take up until January? Are we expanding the length of time on the other end of the task force as well? Um, well, let's fast forward here and see when. We are not in this okay. draft. Uh, Rep. Colston. Oh, Rep. Colston, we need you to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. When we were having the conversation about equity, I think the other side of the coin is skills and competencies. Um, because this the powers and duties, it's, it's, a tall, it's a tall ask, I think, in such a short amount of time. And I don't see any language here that references anything about skills and competencies needed in order to do the work. So I don't know, is that an assumption that the appointing authorities will be seeking out those with those skills and competencies to be effective? Um, I'm just wondering where, where does that play into this? Yeah, it's a, uh, an interesting point to consider. Um, I guess we, we can assume that, uh, that each entity who, who is an appointing authority will, uh, will choose based on their belief on what, what the appropriate skill set is. Um, but happy to, happy to have a committee discussion about that. And, and if I could add, you know, when we're talking about how much time is required for this body to do um, to do an excellent job, I, I, I just go back to the powers and duties. I mean, how much time will be required to produce the work that produces the report? That to me is, is, is where the questioning should be. And not that we just add on another month or two, but trying to be a little more uh, you know, uh, just systemic about it, just in figuring out, you know, how is this going to work and, and will there be enough time? It's complicated, yes. Yep, yep. Uh, let's see, Rep Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in regards to the, the timelines here, uh, there are situations I've been in many times where I feel um, compressed deadlines um, are both inspiring and even liberating. And uh, my concern is that if we keep pushing this back, things tend to get pushed back even more. And, and I think a tighter timeline can inspire members to get the work done. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hooper. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't disagree with my friend from the southern part of the state. I'll expand a little bit on what Hal said, though. I'm uh, interested in quality here as, as well as speed. Uh, do we have the facility to, I mean, as it's written, it becomes law, it starts, it ends. Uh, do we have the facility to put a relief valve in, committee on committees or somebody that could have the power to extend if necessary? And secondly, if people who are working for a living get appointed, do they get release time? We talked about that at one point, particularly for the state employees, not saying that anybody will, I would imagine the uh, legislature will get some kind of consideration, but there are people who might serve here that work. Thank you. Uh, I would agree that we should specify that um, active employees who get appointed to this should be granted leave time. I thought we had some language in the original draft that maybe wasn't quite as explicit as we wanted it to be. Um, maybe Becky Wasserman can remember where or Rep Gannon. I believe that that had to do with the VPIC committee members. Yeah, I think it was uh, on VPIC, and, okay. yeah. And not the task force. But I can, I can add it to the task force if that is there. We do a straw poll on that committee? Do we want to specify that active employees who are appointed to the task force should be granted leave time? Okay, I'm seeing enough requisite thumbs around the Zoom screen. The release time thing was more important to me, though, if I may interject. Or not the release time, the release valve. Too many releases. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I know what you mean by release valve. Uh, in case the committee is in the midst of finishing things up and say, you know, we don't have enough time to do, can we have another 20 days? Somebody should be able to grant it. I don't recall seeing that in other interim study groups, but I'm happy to be pointed to a precedent if you can find one and who the releasing authority was, because I don't honestly know who I would want to require this task force to go to if they needed a little more time. Does the committee on committees usually have that power sort of thing? Uh, the committee on committees is, has jurisdiction over the Senate committee uh, makeup. I'll look, thanks. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I, uh, uh, again, reflecting the tightness, I'm with Representative Ricky. I think tight is okay. Um, everybody understands that this is uh, a sort of, uh, you better do it now kind of calling. I would suggest from the testimony we'd heard that we be a little bit directive in two respects. Uh, one respect is to say that the task force is urged to initiate its work in respect to the state employees. That leaves the, the uh, uh, state teachers aspect of this for the second bite, so to say, for reasons that have already come up in testimony. And the second uh, suggestion I have uh, for us to make some policy suggestions uh, um, goes to Representative Colston's uh, observation, and namely, it may sound a little sentimental or a little um, naive, uh, bordering on prescriptive, but we should say something like it, it is, it is an understanding on the part of the proposing committee, us, uh, that we have faith that the appointing authorities will respect their view of the competence, expertise, and uh, dedication to a sound outcome that the appointing agencies take that to heart. Other committee discussion on that or any other points? Uh, 
All right, I'm not seeing any hands. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so looking at that September 1st deadline, um, how was that arrived at basically? What's, what's the significance of that September 1st deadline? I think there was at some point some talk in committee about the urgency of getting to a solution on this uh, in short order. I don't know that there that, that I don't know that I recall any magic uh, about September first. Thank you. So. Um, Rep Higley again. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, if if we're done going over it all, if, if I could just jump back to page eleven under the written copy uh, that goes out to everybody. Um, I've just been thinking about that, and I'm wondering. Um, maybe Rep Hooper mentioned it as well. Uh, how many how many copies are we actually talking about? And um, is, is it more uh, favorable to do it on a um, folks that request a copy? Um, again, uh, I guess uh, a little clarification on just who we're talking to or talking about and how many that might be. How many, how many reports are we talking about sending out? And this would be in the mail, correct? So it's page 11, number yep. two. The committee shall send a written copy of the report described uh, to the participants and beneficiaries of each plan. So we're talking how many? Um, 800 and something, more than that? Oh, more than that. Um, I would assume. The way I read that, it's um, it, it would go to active employees who are vested in both plans. And, and is that something that's being done now? No. Um, so I guess, again, I just was would throw this out there. Um, is that something that people in the past have requested? And I'm, I'm sure they could probably get it, but um, to send out that many um, and just have them deep sixed, is, is that really a, a favorable thing to do? Just, just a question, I guess. And maybe that, uh, let me see. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Happy to enter into a conversation about uh, more uh, efficient uh, and respectful use of resources in order to get that information out to beneficiaries. I think it's a good point because that could be a lot of mailing cost for a lot of sheets of paper that end up in the recycle bin. Um, yeah. If you have ideas, you know, feel free to throw them out. Um, Rep Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think we're probably talking 22,000 of those reports if we're talking members and being a lover of trees. Uh, there is a report that goes out to members and I, it used to be on paper. Now I think it's electronic. So uh, depending on how liberally we use the word printed. Uh, and how about the Joint Fiscal Committee? Throw that out. You mean have them take a look at the, the cost, uh, Representative Hooper? No, that was the question I got before about who could give the leave to continue since it involves money basically. Um, so committee discussion about written copy of the report versus leaving that to the discretion of the VPIC to, uh, to send a link to a website as opposed to sending the entire report in physical hard copy. Representative Anthony. 
Yes, thank you. I just wanted to piggyback. I had a constituent who said, and I believe, uh, uh, as it were, she uh, is a teacher. And she said uh, she receives an annual report as to what's going on with the teacher's pension already. And I just was hoping that uh, some uh, folks who could figure out how we could piggyback on something that goes out um, automatically already, and whether it would be compliments of uh, a partnership with the representative uh, unions involved, uh, I, I did not know. But I, 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 there must be ways to piggyback so that Rep Higley's uh, worst case scenario can be avoided of 22,000 trees or whatever, sheets of paper and trees. <laughs> Thanks. Rep Pihovsky. Thank you. I sure hope we don't need a full tree for each report anyways. Um, I'm wondering if we can do some sort of opt-in or opt-out. I, I think of my, you know, my retirement plan. I save a couple dollars on my membership fees each year if I opt in to electronic reports. So I wonder if there's a way to structure that, that people, if, because some people really want those written reports and they could opt in or out as a way of sort, because I think a lot of people probably do want them to be electronic, but then also thinking about how they, how we structure that in a way, and this is way above my tech capacity, but so it hits their actual inbox and not their spam. Cause I know that sometimes my retirement ends up in my, like information ends up in my spam. And so thinking about how, where that comes from. So it would actually hit people's inbox if they opt in to electronic or out of paper. Rep Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was my exact comment Comment because every time I go on to like my billing statements for anything, they try to encourage me to go paperless. Um, and I am someone who uses a lot of paper, so I'm fine with something being emailed to me, um, but emailed in a way that I, you know, can obtain it and now have it go to my spam um, and then print it out myself if I want to read it that way. Um, and having it more accessible, um, you know, or links more accessible or making it so that way if people have problems troubleshooting, they can actually get it resolved fast, not have to be sent down rabbit holes would be my biggest ask of this is if it's going to be electronic, make it so that way people have, you know, no problems obtaining the information they need. Good points. And I wonder, Becky, if you might um, have the ability to put some creative thought into how to express this uh, that, that specifies that the committee may offer electronic delivery or... Yeah, I can do both um, some option of elect electronic or, or uh, hard copy delivery, and then also specify that um, it has to be sent out sort of consolidated with any other reports that are distributed by the committee. Mm -hmm. Yep, that would be helpful. Thank you. All right. Um, one note that I would flag for possible amendment uh, is in the last, on the last page of the bill with respect to compensation uh, we're specifying here not more than six meetings. Um, I suspect if we're starting in June and we're asking them to complete by September, they may want to meet weekly. Um, and that is more than six weeks. So I would think that we should make that um, any limits on, on meetings reflect that they're meeting at least, that they have the ability to meet once a week. Agreed. Representative Hooper. I agree with you, Madam Chair. This is going to get into the weeds pretty quickly and conversations will be intense. Yeah. Would, would 12 meetings work? I don't have my calendar up, but as long as there are 12 weeks, um, then yes. Rep Higley. I was just trying to figure that out. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be 10 weeks?
think it's 12 weeks. It's but 12. 12 weeks? Okay. Um, Rep. Behovsky. Um, my question was sort of answered, but if it's a not more than my ex, I, they don't need to use them all, but they could use them all. So I think that potentially offering a little extra buffer room for meeting, given the enormity of the task at hand is probably better than them not having enough. Uh, Rep Higley is off camera. Maybe that's a hand from before. Rep Hooper. Uh, following up on what Rep. Vihosky said, I think we should give some acknowledgement to the fact that there may very well be subcommittees um, to bite off a little bit and take it someplace else. Um, that's the way we've handled this before. So, Representative Anthony. I'd suggest to uh, put the limit of no, no more than 15 exclusive of committee uh, meetings in the interim. Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I know with the law enforcement retirement study committee that there were subcommittees that, that worked. Um, they're very small, it was like Senator White, myself, and the treasurer staff. Um, and another member too. And I'm not sure if we got compensated or not, but I know subcommittee meetings did go on with respect to that. Um, and I don't think it was contained in the statute. Um, so just, just move for that. Mm -hmm. Representative LeClaire. Um, why do we need to limit the number of times they can meet as long as they're within the time frame? Um, let's just say I can recall having some contract negotiations on the school board where it was one of those times where we were able to meet a couple times in a given week. So I'm, I'm more about the time frame than I am, I think, the number of meetings. I, I guess I would just uh, answer that with respect to drafting is that typically we put in a number to for budgeting purposes. Um, in this case, the some of the funds are coming from the legislative budget and some are coming from the treasurer's office. So you're not making a specific appropriation. So I don't know if it's um, as necessary, but if you were making a specific appropriation, you would need to specify the number of meetings such that uh, the appropriation would be able to pay for the per diem and reimbursements for those members that are receiving them. It's one of those things that you get asked when you report a bill down the hallway in the appropriations committee. <laughs> All right. Other uh, committee discussion on this or other aspects of the bill, uh, Madam Chair. This, uh, the appropriate. Am I missing it? Wasn't there two hundred thousand bantied about here for this task? Am I, I missing it? There was an appropriation for um, for actuarial and legal services, I believe. Oh, so I'm, I'm, I'm referencing the appropriations on page 23 for attendance at the meetings. That's where it has the, the not more than language of the number of meetings. Um, and so the payments for the legislative members are coming from money appropriated to the General Assembly. And then the payments for those members who aren't state employees are coming from money appropriated to the state treasurer. Does that help answer your question? You good? All right, Representative Hooper. Uh, I, I would agree with my friend from Barry. I, I think if history is any indication, uh, slow meeting at the beginning when you're formulating the stuff that you want the actuary to work on is appropriate, but towards the middle to end when the actuary starts throwing information back at you, uh, 
putting a week between those meetings could be detrimental because you don't you don't get the option to say well what if and then come back in two days and talk about it when it's fresh other committee discussion about either the appropriation or generally about other parts of the bill All right, um, so I guess uh, we have on our committee agenda, we have a scheduled um, break away from the screen for a little while. And so I guess what I'd like to suggest is that we come back at 3.30 um, to, uh, to take another look uh, through the bill. If you have areas that you wanna make a specific uh, recommendation or amendment on, um, please have that uh, ready and articulated so that we can have some committee discussion about that. Um, and uh, so we will be on break now until 3.30, unless anyone has a burning question about the assignment for what to do between now and then. All right.